it had to be quite a sight to see this pool of Bethesda just inside the wall around Jerusalem with with the temple the temple mount off in the distance quite a sight to see really two pools of water two large basins of water one was more of a, a holding tank of sorts as water from outside the city flowed into it water that could be used to fill the second pool as needed the second pool was more of a, a swimming pool of sorts with wide steps large steps leading down into it but it was a a pool a basin of water not so much for recreation or cooling down it wasn't so much for bathing or washing up no this pool of bethesda was a pool a basin of water for ritual and ceremonial cleansing and washing but it was beautiful quite a sight to see it was surrounded by five colonnades five covered porches five porticos but it was also known as a healing pool. And so this pool of Bethesda, just inside the city wall of Jerusalem, with the temple off in the distance, was also surrounded by people who were lame and mute and blind and deaf. There was a legend attached to this pool of Bethesda that when the waters were stirred inside that second basin, waters stirred by one of God's holy angels sent down to stir them, that the first person into the pool would miraculously be healed of whatever ailment, whatever impediment, handicap they had. That would have been quite a sight to see, I'm sure. Perhaps that legend is true. Perhaps God really did send one of his holy angels to stir the waters. Perhaps God did miraculously heal the first one into the pool. Why else would so many who were lame and blind and deaf and mute be lounging around that pool waiting to jump in, waiting to walk in once those waters were stirred? It had to be quite a sight to see. It was for one man in particular, a man who was paralyzed, a man who had been paralyzed for 38 years. He was one of those people lounging around that pool Quite a sight for him to see because all he could do was watch. He wasn't fast enough ever to be the first one into the pool when those waters were stirred. All he could do was watch, paralyzed, unable to help himself into the pool. No one else seemingly to help him into the pool until one day, until one day when Jesus came along. Until one day when, when Jesus came along and had compassion on him. Until one day when Jesus came along and had compassion on him and asked him, would you like to get well? That had to be quite a sight to see. A man who had been paralyzed for 38 years, quite paralyzed as he wasn't able to get himself into that pool, quite alone as he had no one to help him get into that pool. Quite a sight, especially when that man was suddenly standing on his own two feet for the first time in nearly four decades. Not only standing, but rolling up his mat and prepared to walk home. Quite a sight to see. One problem, though. It was a Saturday. It was a Saturday when Jesus saw this man and had compassion on him and performed this miracle. It was a Sabbath day. No work was to be done on the Sabbath day. Jesus should not have healed this man. Jesus should not have told this man to get up to carry his mat, to walk anywhere carrying that man. And the man should not have done this, not according to the religious leaders of the day anyway. No, they resented Jesus, full of disdain and hate and hostility and animosity. They went looking for Jesus. And when they found him, they scolded him. They rebuked him. They, they reprimanded him. But Jesus... His response when they came calling? My father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. Well, they got it. They caught it. They understood. God the Father is not bound by the Sabbath law, not man-made Sabbath day, not his own Sabbath law. God the Father is God. He's always at work. Jesus, too, is working. Jesus is doing what he sees his Father do. They got it. They caught it. They understood it. Jesus was claiming to be the Son of God, not bound by Sabbath law. Jesus was claiming to be God himself. Blasphemy. Oh, they hated him all the more. They wanted to kill him. Jesus' response to that, you guys ain't seen nothing yet. 
if me healing a paralyzed man on the Sabbath day gets under your skin, you just wait. You ain't seen nothing yet. The lame are going to walk. The blind are going to see. The deaf are going to hear. The mute are going to talk. Just as the prophet Isaiah said they would. When Messiah comes. When the promised Savior comes on the scene. Oh, they hadn't seen nothing yet. The centurion's servant healed. Ten lepers cured. Five thousand fed. A storm stilled. Walking on water. Demons cast into a herd of pigs. You ain't seen nothing yet. The Lord of creation has power over creation. The Lord of life has power over death. The widow's son at name, alive. Jairus' daughter in the back room, alive. His friend Lazarus in the tomb, four days, alive. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. But not just physical life, no, spiritual life as well. Jesus came on the scene to give life to those who were dead in their transgressions and sins. If the healing of this paralyzed man on the Sabbath day caused them problems, then Jesus is saying, you, you ain't seen nothing yet. Early in his ministry, still to come, the Sermon on the Mount, the Bread of Life discourse, the parable of the prodigal son, the parable of the good Samaritan, the parable of the sower and the seed, the lost sheep, the lost coin. I'm the light of the world. I'm the gate for the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the vine. Holy week, questions plied with questions day after day. Questions about taxes. Questions about his authority. Questions about the resurrection. Questions about marriage at the resurrection. Jesus answered them all with authority. He spoke as one who had authority. He spoke as one they'd never heard before. He amazed them all. And every word, every teaching of Jesus brought someone to faith in him. Made the dead alive. It was true for Peter. James and John, true for the rest of the apostles, true for Nathaniel under the fig tree, Nazareth, anything good come from there? Spiritual life. The adulterous woman about to be stoned, the, the Samaritan woman at the well full of questions and full of guilt, the, the little children who are being brought to Jesus. How about the thief on the cross? The centurion who was overseeing his crucifixion. Nicodemus, who had come to him at night, all of them were dead. But Jesus gave them life, spiritual life, as only God can give. Jesus is equal to the Father. Jesus is God himself. If the religious leaders hated Jesus after he healed this man on the Sabbath day, they would hate him even more after each miracle, after every parable. It says, if they said, we'll see your love and compassion and we'll, we'll raise you hate and resentment. We'll see your, your massive following and we'll raise you a hate-filled mob. We'll see the, the life that you're giving all these people and we'll go all in as we gladly take your life from you. Jesus, you ain't seen nothing yet. The plot, the plan, the scheme, the goal. Arrest him. Try him execute him. Oh, you ain't seen nothing yet. The depth of their disdain and the height of their hatred and the length of their loathing. You ain't seen nothing yet until you look into the recesses of your own heart as I've peered into mine. Any resentment residing there, resentment for Jesus, you didn't get your way. Any loathing living there in the deep recesses of your sinful heart because life isn't fair. Any hatred hanging out there because you still got this problem. You're still hurting. You still have this pain. And Jesus, you haven't fixed it yet. 
any disdain for Jesus dwelling there in the dark recesses of your sinful heart because this life, this faith, this cross, it's just too much to bear. It's too difficult to handle. It's too heavy to carry. You can see nothing yet. But God has. God does. God sees it all. Our sin even what we think we keep hidden. We sang about it in Psalm 90. Maybe we missed it. Moses said, You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. God sees our sin. And today he says to you and to me, You ain't seen nothing yet. Because those men who were so bound and determined find Jesus and to kill him ran into a man who was even more bound and even more determined to save them and to save you and to save me and to save the world. You ain't seen nothing yet. The, the crown, the cross, the nails, the blood, the sweat, the tears. You ain't seen nothing yet. The wages of sin, he'd pay them. The cup of suffering, he'd drink every last drop. The wrath of God, he would appease it. The justice of God, he would satisfy it. The side, the spear, the sudden flow of blood and water, the cloth around his dead body, the tomb in which it was laid, the stone that was rolled in front of it. You haven't seen anything yet. Wait for it. Three days. Wait for it. See the place where they laid him? He's not here. He's risen. He's alive. Just as he said, put your finger here. And the hole left by the nail. Touch my side where they pierced my my side with that spear. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Jesus lives. The victory's won. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Jesus is God. He gives physical life even to himself. But still, you ain't seen nothing yet until you look into a basin of water. Until you look into the pages of Scripture. Until you look at bread and wine. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. You, me, and all who believe in him, not dead, but alive. In Jesus, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Adoption, children, heirs, meaning, purpose, identity, forgiveness, righteousness, salvation. These words are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and that by believing you might have life in his name. Bread and wine, body and blood. Christ has once again assured you your sins are all forgiven. Be pardoned, peace. Forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. But still, you ain't seen nothing yet. The time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. That will be a sight to see. The last day, the Lord himself, Jesus, coming down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, the dead in Christ will rise, and we who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That will be quite a sight to see when Jesus creates the new heavens and the new earth, the home of righteousness, our home, where there'll be no more sadness, no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more hurt, no more tears. No Satan and no sin. No temptation and no trial. No disease and no death. Not necessarily streets of gold or pearly gates, but so much more. The Lamb. The Lamb at the center of the throne and all his holy angels and all his holy people and you and me and all who believe in him. With Job we say, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God, I myself and not another. How my heart yearns within me. That, my Finally, we'll be 
quite a sight to see. Amen. Please stand.